The cold, flooded washes at Wellney are now perhaps the last really wild place left in the fens. These bleak, flat wastes, lying between three cuts of the River Ouse, have a certain empty appeal. But this attraction would soon pale if we had to live here permanently. Yet a square mile of these washes and flooded meadows has had to provide for one man a living and a way of life. And Ernie James of Welney would choose to be nowhere else. We want to be doing what you want to do, living where you want to do. And that's the main thing in life, I think. We've got everything here by our money. Ernie James has always lived close to the water, and his home at Plover Cottage is tucked down out of the wind beside the bank of the old Bedford River. You won't often find him there, because most of his life is spent out in his boat on the washes. And at this time of the winter, he retires to his shed to make eel traps, while his thoughts look forward to spring. I've been making eel traps and eel nets near well over 50 years. I always like making something what I know I'm going to catch something with. The nets, we used to knit them in the winter time, again the fire side, ready for the, the coming year. And the eel traps, we used to make them when it was rough outside, we used to make them on the shelter. And we was always thinking what we was going to catch with these things. We, we was pitting our, our wits against nature. The Jameses are now the last in the line of old wealthy families to be still living off the washes. Mrs. James, like her husband, has a long dynasty of fowlers and fishermen behind her. She came from the Smart family, and both she and Ernie remember the immense rivalry between the gunners when each washman jealously guarded his patch. Well, we all had our own stretch. I should think we all had a bit, I don't know, a bit of mile each, I should think. There used to be Hagen Smart down at the bottom end. He was a, one of the best punt gunners on the wash. Then there used to be Cutty C, Will Smart. Then there was Joe Butcher, what I had my gun off. And then when you got up this way, there was old Harry Kent that used to keep the Welney Hotel and his brother William, who I started my career with. So there were several punt gunners at that time of day. To us, these gunners may seem to have a legendary and almost mythical quality. But for Ernie, they're still with him, for he's incorporated their knowledge as part of his living tradition and almost everything he's ever known about eels or stalking duck. He learned first from watching, listening, and talking to the fowlers before him. Ah, worst people, we never had one job. We, we had to adapt ourselves perhaps 10 different jobs, and they used to come in as the seasons of the year come in. In few areas can the changes of the seasons be more apparent than in the washes. Once the leaves are back on the willows, the pace of Ernie's life alters, for every one of his activities has to be dovetailed precisely into its ideal season, for he, like the birds, moves with the months of the year. Well, the old club was in the, in the springtime, they tumbling about and diving about and calling bullock a week and the snipes as a, as a billy lamb and a, the, the wash is all alive and the, with the birds, everything wakes up in the spring.
Ernie is part of the natural order of things. Most of us, enmeshed in more complex economies, are immune from the elements. But for him, the wind and the weather really matter. He has that quite unconscious awareness of animals, birds, seasons and skies, which can only develop fully in someone isolated and away from the rowdy, standardized pressures of much of 20th century life. But out on the washes, existence is simpler. You have to walk, not ride or commute. Your rhythms are those of the seasons. And when the May is in bloom, Ernie's eye is on the river, for this is the month to catch eels. The best time to catch these eels is when it's a small night and you come up, you walk in your gardens in the morning, you see where all the worms has been up through the, the lawns, leaving them little blobs. And that's when you go and look your eel traps when you've got your eels. When the worms come up, the eels are biting in the rivers. It's only when you see Ernie at work that you can see what a specialist he is. He knows the most extraordinary things about eels, that they enter traps tail first, that they can force their way through any chink or weakness in a mesh, and sometimes they'll jump two feet into the air. And for every one of his operations, there's a reason. All this knowledge Ernie holds, he has either picked up from personal experience, or else he has had it handed on to him as part of a tradition from the fowlers and fishermen before him. And like the horseman's magic on the farm, it will die with its owners, for none of it is written down. The gentle, slow rivers of the fens are perfect for eels. They've been caught here for centuries as generations of fishermen have moved up the Delph. The unhurried pace of Ernie at work appears simple and easy. But behind it all are centuries of expertise. His traps, or hives as he calls them, are made of willow. Though they wear out every two years, he's never gone over to wire because only he would know that eels suck willow. So the trap itself, as well as the worms inside, acts as a lure. You put a trap in in one place and it all the heavy eels in every day. In another one, perhaps, it can be set there for a week and you wouldn't get only a few hardens. And I think they've got trails and they like sheep, they follow one another. When you get one in, they keep going in and going in uh, till it gets full. Uh, a lot of people, they all say to me, well, that's a room and we've got some of your traps and we can't catch any. You must make your traps different, and uh, that's the art in the game, knowing where to set them. If there's an old uh, willow overhanging in the water and you put a trap underneath there, they'll all catch eels there because they like willow, they like the suck willow, the bark of the willow. I mean... Uh, we don't tell everybody our secrets, what we're doing, you know, else everybody would be catching on to it. Ernie crosses this bank dividing the old Bedford from the Delft on most days of the year. Unlike us, who are generally just cogs in involved interdependent systems, he can rely only on himself and has to make what he can from the wealth that the rivers and the waterside provide. We've got about five acres of willows. We've had them in our family for oh, 100 years or more. And, uh, 
My grandfather used to supply all the basket shops in Ely and, well, practically all over the country with Willers one time. When he bought one acre of land, what I've got today, <clears throat> that's 100 years ago, he paid 200 pounds for that acre then, so there must have been a, a good trade for Willers at that time of day. It must have been a good business. But today, plastic has put an end to the willow trade. No longer do the farmers require potato baskets or skeps for feeding their cattle. And gone forever is the time when the women of Welney lined these banks to peel bark from the osiers and the river resounded with their laughter. Ernie's most vivid memory of the river was hearing the voice of his grandfather shouting downstream to Tom Kent. In the stillness of summer, he could hold conversations four miles away when the long June days were approaching. High summer is Ernie's least profitable time, and it's now that he turns to his scythe. Now he clears the rank growth from the banks. Without this annual cutting, scrub and willows would soon establish to crowd out the flowers. So these blooms must fall if hemlock and loose strife are to reappear the following spring. By July, the waterways are choked, and now not even the lilies can be spared. You see, the weeds have to be cut, and they're cut with shears right across the river. And one man walks one side of the river and, the, and one man the other, and you see saw this and keep walking, and that cuts all the weeds and lilies. You can see them all jumping up behind you. They'd always come to us and say, well, will you come and trim that dike up? We'd perhaps go and do it after we'd done another day's work in the spring when the day has got long. We'd perhaps go and have two or three hours of the night and, you know, just to help a man out. Because they want, you know, a lot of people like that job because it's a damned hard job, a moon is. I'd like to have as many pound notes as the chains me and Herbie's done together. We shouldn't want to do any more work now, only talk about it. When the first rains of autumn arrive, the pace of change on the washes quickens. All through the gentle days of summer, Ernie has been biding his time just cleaning out ditches and roading the banks. But once the dikes begin to fill up, then his thoughts can turn away from the land to the skies and the wildfowl that the wet winter weather will bring. And as a professional fowler and hunter, the washman reached his full stature. 
Professionalism colors all Ernie's activity. He's as dedicated to his task as the short-eared owl stooping over its quarry. It will be quite wrong to see him, as some might, as a folksy figure deliberately choosing to stand by antiquated crafts out of a sentimental attachment to the past. Like all Fenman, Ernie has a hard, realistic head. He would have had wire eel traps, auto sides and fiberglass boats long ago if they had worked best. For him, there has to be one quite unromantic criterion of judgment. Results. With the arrival of floods, the washers take on a new unity. Gone are the neat, subdivided meadows of summer. All is now one, under acres of water. It's not local conditions which trigger the change, but rather the rainfall back in the Midlands that makes the difference. Then the washers become an overspill as a controlled system of flood relief. Today, the big floods, when the fowlers had to move temporarily out of their homes, seem rarer. But even when only a few inches cover the washers, the whole area seems utterly transformed. Well, everything looks lovely when it's flooded, the trees and the willows, especially when the sun's out, they throw a lovely shatter on the water, and as soon as the water gets on the wash, we get thousands of weeds and duck and teal and buick swans and all kinds of birds. You know, when there's curtains out, well, well, when they get up, they really block the sun out sometimes. Every winter, thousands of wildfowl fly down onto these flooded meadows attracted by the easy, shallow feeding that the washers provide. Their arrival was always eagerly awaited by the fenmen, for upon their safe coming, much of his winter income would depend. But first in his attention was a lovely bird we now hardly associate with the table, the peewit, lapwing, or green plover. There's nothing the plover as it used to be years ago. There was thousands and millions of birds one time about here. The plover catching was one of the best things of all the wallfowlers about here because we, we used to catch so many plover. You might catch up to three or four hundred birds and uh, in the peacetime, when I'm talking before the war, when the wages was low, we perhaps earned a hundred pound in a week, and you'd got no expense. It weren't like punt gunning. Well, I used to make my own nets, most people did, and buy some new pulley lines every year, perhaps wouldn't cost you five pound for the whole season for, for your tackle. I mean, it was, it was a, you know, all profit job. The best days for catching plover was when that had been a little frosty or a little foggy in the morning, and the old birds used to sit in the fens on the potato land while they used to feed on there, and then when the sun broke out, say perhaps about nine or ten o'clock, and broke through, they'd all come out the fens with their legs hanging down all mud where they'd come off the the fields, and they'd come onto your net and they'd wash you up and it was all made squashy, and that was the idea, let the birds wash up. Well, we used to whistle them in, you know, make a, a call, the same call as the plover used to call. Then, as soon as they started coming in, they saw your decoys, and, and that was that. They swung round then and landed on your bed.
of course, I mean, that's, that's all done with now. It was stopped in 1947, you see. Of course, you think about it when you see all these birds about it, you think to yourself, well, God, it's a lovely day today. I'd been knocking on them back today if I'd have been at the job, but I mean, uh, if anything gets done away with, well, it, it never gets put on anymore. Lapwing today can now only be netted under the strict supervision of the British Trust for Ornithology, who ring and release them for scientific research. Biggest freeze up the world was 1962-63. You start the freezing here uh, about the 1st of December. It froze this river up. Well, everywhere was froze up for 70 days, and I measured the ice here. It was 18 inches thick in the thickest of the frost. And there was five horses running up and down this river one day, one behind the other, like what they got out of a field. There weren't a bird, there weren't a duck, there weren't nothing nowhere. And the pigeons laid about, you know, and blackbirds and things with starvation and cold, you could go and pick them up anywhere. in the winter when everything got totally froze up and we couldn't do anything we used to put our skates on and do a bit of skating and of course I was one of the top skaters at that time of day as I ran for the championship of England in 1929 you see most of the champions was all wealthy men lived in a stone's throw of me and I knew them all like Turkey Smart, Jim Fish Cut his seed, we was brought up with them and went on the ice with them when we was young. There used to be quite good money in the skating business one time because all these farmers was interested in was a good skate. they take you under their wing and pay all your expenses and they'd call you their man. And they'd put up ten pounds first prize, five pounds second. And uh, if the ice lasted and you was a good skater, I mean, you'd perhaps knock up a hundred pounds or perhaps more in that time. A road bridge today crosses the river where once Ernie and his father worked the ferry to carry the washman across the floods into Welney village, which still remains the focus of the area. On occasions, however, the odd person would miss the boat, and Ernie can remember old Will Kent trudging waist-high through the deeps for his pint, and then almost drowning the tap room as he tipped out the water from his pockets. Still, still going to keep your own hand at the job. Yes, yes. Morning. 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 Yeah. Ern is fortunate in having a community readily available within a few hundred yards of his home. He can, whenever he feels like it, move quickly between the isolation of the washers and the company of a chat in the Lamb and Flag. Yes, I brought the news, Ernie. Brought it round, yes. Although for most of his time he's working way out in the river by himself, you couldn't really label him as a loner. He admits to needing friendship and people at times to balance his life. Oh, well, I'll have to go in there, Ernie. In a tight little Fenland village like Welney, the pub is naturally a focus of gossip, and there's very little news around here which is not first turned over in the bar. 
I see Roger, he took a few sheep down the bank again this morning. Has he? <laughs> yes. And I wish get some mutton then, but... Yeah, yeah. But as well as the odd snippet of news, Ernie's real pleasure at the flag is simply a beer and a chance to remember and chat with an old friend, Herbie Wayman. Yes, I, I took my traps down the bank. I'm going to uh, have a go down on the banks for a start, and then I shall take them in the fen. But I got a fortnight, three weeks down here along the bank for a start, you know. Don't you poison any in there? No, not along the bank. You can't poison very well along the old bank. They got too much feed. There can be few pubs left now where conversation can revolve around moles rather than football or the winner of yesterday's race. And it's precisely because Ernie can find at the pub company and conversation with people like himself who know his world and talk his language on the strange ways of the mole that he values his visit to the Lamb and Flag. Have you ever catch two moles at once? No. No, I never even ever catch two moles at the time. Did you, ever catch, did you ever catch a white? No, I've catched a sandy one and a, a, a proper mole colour. But I know old Brown, he catched you along the bank here one week. Yeah, I know. I, I saw one of them. I never catched a white in the town. No, I think they must have whitewashed them. I think that was a little I bit... I think of... old Brownie whitewashed them before he showed us. <laughs> Don't you? I shouldn't be surprised. I, uh, had a good Strangers at the flag rarely fail to remark on the punt guns. Those washmen must have been a size if they held them up to their shoulders. But Ernie's working memories of them are no less incredible. Well, 48 was the biggest shot I ever had. 48 mallard with it. Well, really? Yeah. You didn't kill them all, did you? Well, I got them all in the boat, so that's good to know. Well, that's and got good. them home. Yeah, well, that's good. <clears throat> but now, I'm retired, I shall leave it to these other blokes now. Well, they won't disturb them much, I don't think. I don't know, they might frighten them a bit if they don't kill any. Well, they won't kill blue soap, but I can hear on it. <laughs> I heard a bloke, he shot 50 carriages away the other night and he never did <laughs> only get one mallard. Uh, well, I should have got a hiding if I'd have done that when I went up the missus. Because <laughs> if, I, if I got up one morning and went out, and then get and then she said, Well you might just well lay to bed. Yeah, well that is true and you're done. <laughs> Herbie and Ernie could talk on endlessly with tales about moles or on eel catching, but for them, as with most of the old washmen, there was always one subject which seemed to distill the essence of all their experience. Wild fowling for duck from a gunning punt. Ernie admits that his most enduring memory of childhood was his excitement at hearing the report of Hagen Smart's gun and then seeing the smoke whiff across the skyline as the ducks lifted. And of course, when they made a kill, no one was more secretive than a gunner. Ernie well remembers old Will Kent only moving his bag at nightfall when all was quiet on the river. The magic of punt gunning was dependent in part on its difficulty. On a muzzle loader, you had only one shot, so all your experience had to be directed into making that single firing really count. There's lots of ways of getting to these ducks, and you'd got to be crafty, and you used to have to hold your boat and lay perfectly still, perhaps for five minutes, and then they'd start feeding again, or they wouldn't take any notes, and then you'd draw up a little closer, and that's how it was done. You had, you had to have plenty of patience for that, Joe. 
Well, I went out one morning, this was in 1947, when that hard winter were, and I looked through my glasses, and I could see a tremendous lot of birds, about half or three quarters of a mile further down the wash, sit on the ice, and I stalked all the way down the bankside, and I remember it well today, where I was going for a start, the sun was rising over the bank and it was right in the eye, so I let my boat sort of drift a bit down to get the sun out of my eyes, and I went, well, as near as I wanted to these ducks. And I shot at them and I see them as they jumped, it sort of cut a railroad right through them. Hey, I got 48 that shot. The circular rhythm of life out on the washes begins again as another winter passes into spring. But behind all the changes and adjustments of activity that the movement of the months demand, there is a certain timeless quality surrounding Ernie James's world. In a sense, he's a most primitive figure, whose roots twine through dynasties of wash fowlers and fishermen, back literally to the fens of Heriwood the Wake. Ernie straddles time. If you plucked him out from the 20th century and placed him back in the wild, undrained medieval fens, you sense that, unlike most of us, he would survive. The merging of present with past is apparent also in a deeper sense. Ernie's highly particular area of wisdom on, say, the movement of eels in the mud, or where to probe with his glaive, is inherited knowledge, which has been passed from fathers to sons down through generations of long forgotten families around Welney. Ernie now stands as the final inheritor of that process, a curious fossil figure of the primitive washes and rivers surviving out of his time as the last embodiment of the old fen tiger's race memory. It is precisely because of the almost unconsciously received connections he has with the lore and knowledge of the ancient fen that makes Ernie James an interesting figure. When he passes on, a whole culture will go with him. A language, a way and a wisdom about birds and fish, people and animals, which we of a different technologically advanced world don't know and can never reclaim. To many, especially those of us who live in the pressure and pace of the towns, Ernie James's life by the river may appear just rather quaint and attractive, and it's easy to view him sentimentally through clouds of nostalgia. But in fact, he deserves more critical attention, for through his simple life, much of the unrecorded human history of the Fens is reflected. I don't work for a living, I get done all right with that. I don't toil all the day, simply because I don't get no pay. Some people work for long, they say it's all sunshine and gay. If I can't get sunshine without any work, I'd rather stay out in the rain. Ernie won't work for a living much longer. His simple world has passed on. 
plastics have replaced his osiers. Our taste for eels isn't as general as it once was. Lapwing is strictly protected, and wild fowling's now a sport, not a business. But although many of the old ways have gone, the washes even now have a distinctiveness all of their own. The flooding of the washes in winter has inhibited the arrival of harsh 20th century forms of exploitation, preserving between the rivers a sort of island of antiquity. But if once the ebb and flow of the rivers was to cease, then, quite catastrophically, the whole area would alter. No eels, no wildfowl, no skating, no gunning. The washes today are not as wild and wet as they used to be, and perhaps with the increasing need to conserve water in the future, they won't even let the floods on at Erith anymore. And ironically, no one is more detached about changes than Ernie himself. I tell you what I think, I think in years to come, they'll build these reservoirs and that, and so you wouldn't get it flooded here. Eh? See, they, they could cultivate it, they could build on it, and everything else, and I think that's what will come. I don't mean this to me now, because I shouldn't be buried here then, I shouldn't think. I think I should be gone, where the rest of the old gunners are.